Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. Let us lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving. We are here to sing a new song to the Lord. Joyfully we will sing. Our voices will blend our song. Out of love, God created a world of wonders. The goodness of the Lord is in our midst. Join your voices with the sounds of the earth. The beauty of earth can be heard in this place. Welcome to worship. Welcome Please join us in the opening prayer. Lord, we are astounded by the death and power of your love. Turn to page 818 in your United Methodist hymnal for Psalm 98. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. God's right hand and his holy arm have gotten the victory. The Lord has declared victory and has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. The Lord has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all of the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with his lyre, with the lyre of the sound of melody. Let the sea roar in all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, who comes to judge the earth. The Lord will judge the world with and the peoples will judge it. Please turn to page 139 in your United Methodist hymnal for the opening hymn. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty.
Our scripture today is John 15, 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that you, my joy, may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand if you're comfortable to sing our next hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. seated. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for the beauty of your creation, for the gift of new life, for waking us up and getting us here this morning. We thank you for the young voices that bring your word into our midst. We pray, O oh Lord, that from that reading, 
shared with us by Darby, that not only did we hear her voice, but through her voice we heard your word. And may your word fall upon our hearts once again this morning as we hear it together. And we humbly pray that in some way, it will be again that seed that bears the fruit of love for you, for one another, and for the world. May the meditations and the wanderings of our mind this morning be pleasing and acceptable to you as we turn our hearts and the eyes of our hearts to focus on you. In your holy name we pray this and so much more. Amen. It's been 10 months since I arrived here in Belmont, and upon my arrival, and I continue to walk in circles, there's one circle that I walk every morning. It's probably the first thing I do. I get my cup of coffee and get Romeo, the Beagle Basset Hound, my favorite companion, and we walk around the reservoir at least once, and sometimes later in the day, if there's time, Romeo and I take another walk. There's another circle that I do faithfully in the morning. It's right after I finish with Romeo, I'll take off down the hill towards Fresh Pond and run around Fresh Pond and back up to the parsonage. I've enjoyed this routine, these disciplines, because they've given me an opportunity to walk a circle that others are walking. Whether it's the reservoir or around Fresh Pond, I encounter people that I've seen before. And as time goes by, even here in New England, we find ways of greeting one another with more than a smile or a nod of the head or a wave of the hand. It's interesting how we get used to each other, and sooner or later, our greetings become conversation. And we find ourselves sharing in this community that is within this circle, the circle that we travel faithfully most every day. And together in worship, we move in and out of circles. The circles of the liturgical year, the seasons that we know so well. And we also move in and out of a circle of scripture Many, if not most, United Methodist churches use what we call the lectionary, the scheduling of scripture. And it puts us in a circle, a year A, a year B, a year C, back to year A. And so the stories of scripture put together by others help us move in circles together through the word of God and enable us to find things that are new or interesting for preaching, teaching, praying, and meditating. This particular year, year B, that we're in, I found a little circle within a circle in the Easter season. So we might think of the whole year B as one circle and the Easter season as another circle. And within this Easter season, there's a circle of readings that come to us from 1 John and the Gospel of John. And they're readings that started on the 15th of April, and they're readings about love. And particularly out of the Gospel of John, there's that one chapter, chapter 15, but 1 John complements the, the Gospel readings. And you can find yourself going in circles around Jesus' words of love. In John's words of love, either speaking the words of Jesus or adding his own commentary. A couple of years ago, I took a class on active meditation. It was the Eastern practices. It wasn't where we would be sitting down, cross-legged on a pillow or in a chair. They were active meditations where you were moving in a meditative way or making some kind of repetitive sound. And the classes would go from 45 minutes to an hour. There was one class that I found quite interesting and it was a little strange to begin with. But it was a meditative practice, and I can't tell you exactly from what tradition it came from, but it was the act of spinning around. 
one would hold up his or her hand like this, and you would spin, well, as fast as you could. And you would do that for half an hour or 45 minutes, spinning. Now, you would think, well, how could you stay on your feet spinning like that? Wouldn't you get sick, whatever? You would hold your hand up like this. And as you spin around, you keep your focus on the palm of your hand. And if you go fast enough, a strange thing happens, and we've seen this in other effects, but your hand starts to stay positioned while you're going around, and your arm actually and your hand are going around. If you keep your focus on your hand, it appears that your hand is just floating there. You're going around, but you feel like you're just focused on one thing, your hand. And you have to be. If you put your hand down or you lose your focus, you will go down too, and it happens. People would spin and would trip or fall down. I found that uh, not only a peculiar way of meditating, but I understood that once you stayed focused on the hand, you could receive a meditative state. You could rest and relax in that focused position while spinning. Well, the Gospel of John is writing to a congregation that is spinning. It's a congregation that is not only spinning, but they're losing their focus. It's a time for a congregation where things are simply not going at all right. As a matter of fact, not only are they not going right, being a Christian in any congregation, never mind John's, was a very risky venture. And so people were starting to lose focus. They were starting to abandon the congregation. It wasn't because they didn't like the pastor or the preaching or the choir or anything else. It was because they wanted to save their lives. The Romans, they were continually oppressing any group that they thought was a threat. And the religious community, the leadership in the Jewish community was certainly feeling that Christians were a threat. And no longer would these Christians, the community of John and others, be welcomed to worship in the synagogue. They would be pushed out to the margins. And so not only were they feeling under the threat of oppression from the Roman Empire, but now they were being pushed out of their, what they thought was their spiritual home, off to the margins where they were spinning and losing complete focus. tossed outside the circle, so far out that they felt they needed to give up on Jesus so that they could find their way into another circle, whether it was their family, their community, their workplace. And so John's infant church, this, this church in the, the end of the first century, was desperate for a word that would hold them together. They were looking for a message that would bind them together. Those that were still left in that little tiny infant church were wondering, what does God have to say to us in this situation, in this context? And so John lifts up the voice of Jesus. And he recalls these words that Jesus spoke at one time. And Jesus said, this is my commandment. That you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Here we hear the word for a broken community, to love one another. Here we hear the challenge in desperate times to bind one another together to the point where you're willing to take the risk of putting your life down for another. Words for a community of faith that was so hopeless and so desperate for a message 
For they longed to be hopeful and to have endurance to continue what they felt deep in their hearts and believed Jesus wanted them to do, but they needed something to hold them together. And strangely enough, John found the right word. It would be sacrificial love that would be fixed before the eyes of John's community as they spun around trying to find a way to stay upright. Sacrificial love. The gift of giving oneself for another. Last week I participated in a retreat with other clergy in the conference. And yesterday, I also attended a retreat with Annie and Sharice. It was a meeting. It was a training on church life. And both of these events presented the same information in different ways. They were presenting information on the current reality of the church. And I don't need to tell you about the current reality of the church. You can look around and get a glimpse of that. And so it's no secret that fewer and fewer folks are finding time and interest, the ability to stay focused on church life, whatever it is, in their minds or their hearts. We find it harder, and we see throughout the nation, to keep churches open. The doors simply open, the lights on. Both of these two events, we're talking about the number of churches that would close over the course of a year. Numbers that are just too sad to really talk about right now, but it is a reality that thousands are closing. What do we do? Where do we stay focused? How do we keep upright? We can look at all the different reasons and we can point our fingers, oh, it's the forces of technology, it's all those overactive sports schedules. We can do all these different things that are true. In terms of keeping us from gathering in the circle we call church. But it is not just the cultural context. It's not just the cultural context that takes a toll on our community of faith. And while this is our reality, it's also church history. It's not something that is new. It's not something that just happened. I just spoke to you briefly about the challenges of the earliest church, the Church of John. They were having incredible problems just trying to keep their lives, never mind, show up on Sunday or when they worshiped on Saturdays. And so it really isn't a question about survival. You know, the church will say, well, how are we going to survive this? Well, it is not a question about survival because God is always going to find ways for the church to survive. It's not our job to figure out how we're going to survive. God will find ways to hold this circle together. This circle called the church. We don't know what they are, but God has a plan already. And this morning, John is preaching to us. He's saying to us, and he's offering the same words that he offered to those early Christians, to keep your eyes fixed on the center. To keep the eyes of your hearts fixed and the love of Christ for you and for the world. To fix our eyes on the powers that will truly hold us together. It's not going to be a church budget. It's not going to be the four walls. It's not going to be any program. What's going to hold us together is the love of God and the love that we have for each other and for the world. And it's not only the power that will hold the community together, but it's that lasting force that we are called to export into the world. 
And so if we're loving God, loving each other, and we're taking this love out into the world, we have nothing to worry about. Oh, sure, there will be other conditions, economic and social, that will pull things in different directions. It may even pull things apart, but if we maintain our focus as we spin, we'll find ourselves stationary and able to be the church regardless of whatever is happening around us. Does that mean there'll be no change? No, it doesn't. There's going to be change. What we have to do as a people that are in a little bit of a spin, staying focused on Christ and the love of God for us, is to make sure that not only can we export it, but that we find ways to adapt our mission, which is the exportation of love, to the world, the context that we're spinning around in. And so being inside the circle of love, the circle called the church, strengthens us. We find strength from one another as we move inside and outside this particular circle into other circles. You see, John was right. He said, you didn't choose me, says Jesus. I chose you. That we have been chosen for this purpose. This purpose of exporting God's love into the world and finding ways to do it in creative ways that are sustainable and hopeful and endure. And so we all need to be part of a circle or circles of love in some way. And, and the organization or of the church, the way it lives out its, its mission is that we find ways to love one another and to work together in love, even in the conditions that would want to tumble us down. We need to be part of a circle of love where we can feel the presence of God. If you come to church and you feel the love of your neighbor, but you don't feel the love of God, then you've come to a club. That's okay. But the church is not a club. The church is the living body of Christ. So if you come to church, the circle that you enter into should also give you a taste or foretaste of what it feels like to be loved by God. No matter where you come from, who you are, what you've done, what you haven't done, you should be able to come into the circle, no matter how big, how small, what kind of building it is, where it is, you should be able to, and you should be able to guarantee another that if you come into our circle, you will feel the presence and the love of God because we work at that. That is our task. And so we all need to be part of these circles where we can feel the presence of God and one another, where we are pulled towards God and one another, where that force, that love is pulling us together, finding ways to enter into new relationships, finding new ways to work together, finding new ways to express God's love in the world, finding new ways to sing a new song. You can go on and on and on. It's that force that draws us together that got you here this morning that is the hand that will keep us standing. What a gift it is to be of God's plan. What a gift. What a gift it is to be part of this circle that God has called us into to export this love. The psalmist tells us to sing to the Lord a new song, for God has done marvelous things. And if you believe that, You have a reason to love God and to love others. Because even in the midst of the world that spins around us and we think that not so many marvelous things are happening, God is doing marvelous things in our midst. I've recently entered into a small circle of men who are detained in South Bay House of Correction. 
They've been arrested by the Immigration and Customs Enforcement authorities. And because they're undocumented, they're being held until either deported or given some sort of immigration relief. They are fathers. They are former employees. They are brothers. They are nephews. They are friends. And in the South Bay House of Correction, there is a circle of young men like Carlos, who I've been visiting. And so I enter the circle as a stranger from a distance, and I only enter by one person who invited me into it, where I sit with him in a small room with two chairs, and we pray and talk and share together. He invited me into his circle. And he was telling me about the circle within the walls that I can't see into where there are other men like him where they sit together and they find ways of supporting one another, encouraging one another, loving one another, complete strangers. Some from Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Cuba, you name the country. And they do this strange thing. He was telling me how the food in the South Bay House of Correction is not four star, as you can imagine. But there's a way for them to earn a few dollars each day and they buy collectively rice and some seasoning and they don't have anything to cook with but there is a microwave. But they get plastic bags and they, they mix up these meals and they share. They stir it up in the bag, throw it in the microwave, and then they eat out of the bags. And it's something that appeals to them much more than whatever is being offered by the prison. I said, that sounds very familiar to me, the sharing of meals. And then he went on and told me how they read and study scripture together and how they think and, and talk theologically about what is going to happen to them and that no matter what happens to them, whether they're allowed to remain in this country or deported, they believe that God has a plan for them. They have this circle of love for one another and they feel like brothers. I was humbled by the brief invitation to be part of that circle from a distance because I heard testimonies where these men would lay down their lives for their friends. They were happy when one was released and able to go back to a family or community to work or whatever, and they were saddened when they learned that one would be deported because they knew the circle of family that was being broken the hardship and the pain that would be felt. On Friday morning, I had the opportunity to be a witness at my friend Carlos's deportation hearing. He was actually trying to apply for asylum. The merits of his case did not stand up. The judge and the immigration authority graciously offered him voluntary departure, which means you can leave on your own and not be subject to any penalties when you try to return legally. And I listened to him as he tried to tell the judge how important it was for him to stay in his circle and how much he loved his family, particularly his young son. But I knew in his heart that he felt loved by God. That no matter where he ended up, and he will be sent back to Columbia before the 4th of July, that wherever he ends up, he knows in his heart that he will be at home in God's love. And his testimony to me reminds me of the task that we have to be the church, to be the people who can say to anyone, friend, family, stranger, welcome home. It is here 
that we will work with you as hard as we can to create a circle of love where you will feel like you can come and count on experiencing the love of God. A place where God is doing marvelous things in our midst and where we're excited about the marvelous things that we don't even know about yet but that are coming our way because we are bold enough to say out of the power of love and staying focused on that, we're going to find a way to get on what God is doing in these marvelous things. We are a gifted people. We are so blessed. Moving in these circles, these circles called church, held together by this power we call love for God's purposes and for our own purposes, but for God's purposes. And it's out of this love that Jesus came to help us, to teach us, to be our friend, to invite us into an experience of what life is like for him. The one who is so loved by God, that's what he's calling us into, to live into his life, to abide in him, to understand the depth of love that God has for him. It's the same love that he has for me and for you. I never thought I'd be walking in the circles of Jesus. But now when I go out around the reservoir, and I always kind of thought about this, but the more I thought about it this week, it, it started to make more sense. That in the circles that I walk in, in the circles that you walk in and live in, we're encountering Christ along the way. Sometimes we recognize him, sometimes we don't. But he's there. And in the love that we experience, the agape fellowship is the proof. Such that he invites us to not only form circles around him, but circles that hold ourselves together, yes, but he invites us to a table to circle around a table with him and to get a sample, a taste, to experience a communion, a circle. May the circle be unbroken. Amen.